첫 번째 연사로서는 트라이언프의 카멜 바운즈 샴푸니 박사님께서 양성자 및 중성자 방사선 테스트 즉 빔시간을 최대한 활용하는 방법에 대한 발표를 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 벨렌즈 샴푸니 박사님께서는 스위스 CERN에서의 아틀러스 실험과 미국 페미랩에서의 디제로 실험을 연구한 공로로 업살라 대학에서 고에너지 물리학 전공으로 박사학위를 취득하셨습니다. 박사님께서는 헬싱키 물리학 연구소에 합류하시기 전에 맥길 대학교에서 박사후 연구원으로서 애틀라스 실험에 지속적으로 기여해 오셨습니다. 그곳에서 박사님께서는 핵 안전장치에 적용하기 위한 탐지기의 설계 및 테스트를 담당하셨습니다. 오늘의 발표 내용으로는 각빔 입자의 유형의 장점을 설명하시고 시설 운영자로서의 관점으로서 테스트 설계 고려사항에 대한 개요를 제시할 것입니다. 트라이언프의 중성자 및 양성자 방사선 시설 빔라인을 대표적으로 소개할 예정이며 전자부품 및 시스템에 대한 신뢰할 수 있는 적격 데이터 수집이 어떻게 최적으로 이루어질 수 있는지에 대한 방법에 대해서 설명할 것입니다. 벨런즈 샴푸니 박사님을 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. In the talk, I will talk about a little bit of background information on the radiation environment for high reliability ground-based applications, some information about single event effects as background information as to why we do accelerated testing and what are my tips and tricks or my experience on how to do it best. Finally, I'll take the opportunity to introduce Triumph's beamline and capability and show you a little bit what you can do um, at a proton and neutron beam facility. I really like to use this infographic to talk about the radiation in our environment. Um, most of the sources of radiation that we worry about come actually from outside of the earth, from cosmic phenomenon. Um, and then these particles interact with the atmosphere and at, and the um, nature of the radiation mixture changes as you go between the different environments from deep space all the way down to earth. At every level and for every kind of application, you cannot escape being in a radiation environment, but what you need to do and how you need to protect yourself can change. I'll focus on SEs and ground effect, ground-based applications. So what this means is that we will I want to present to you a little bit of information about um, cosmic ray air showers. What happens when a primary cosmic ray, which is most likely a proton, but can be also heavier ions, interacts with the upper atmosphere is that this cosmic ray will interact with an atom in a molecule in the air. It will undergo a first nuclear reaction and transmit some of its energy to the secondary products from this reaction. They will then have high energy and be able to undergo further interactions with the air in the atmosphere. And then a large cascade will ensue. And what we see at ground level is the outcome of the cascade at the very end. Um, these cascades can be very, very large. A single primary cosmic ray can have a footprint on the ground in the tens of square kilometers. There's three main components to the particle content of an air shower. You see it color, co color coded here in blue, the electromagnetic part of the cascade, in red, the muonic, and in blue, the hadronic. We don't really have to worry very much about the electromagnetic component of the cascade. It interacts through the Coulomb force and it isn't very penetrative. 
the at the opposite end you have the muonic component of the cascade made up of neutrinos and muons it is highly penetrative but it has low let and low likelihood of interactions so we mostly can ignore it although i'll come back to it a little bit later most relevant for ground-based applications is the hadronic part of the cascade which is made up of protons neutrons and other mesons like pions they will be the most significant contribution to the radiation environment at ground level. What you see on the next slide is um, on the um, left-hand side, you see a picture of the flux of particle as a function of their energy for different families of particle at sea level. You see that neutrons dominate broadly the total flux, but at higher energies, muon are very much present. And then you have some contributions from the other components of the hadronic part of the air shower cascade, the protons and the pions. If we focused on the neutrons, because they're the most important component, you have on the right of this slide a detailed a plot of the energy spectrum of the neutron. And you see that it is quite featureful. There are two regions of main interest the so-called thermal neutrons, the very low energy neutrons um, here, and you have the fast component of the neutron spectrum about above one or 10 MeV. They can undergo different kinds of interactions with electronic components, and we have to worry about both of these in slightly separate contexts. Moving a little bit away from uh, radiation, I'm talking about semiconductor de devices and SEEs. If you will allow me a, a bit of an overgeneralization, I, one could say that SEEs are always about ionization, charge deposition in a sensitive volume. Um, it's always the process of electron hole pair creation through ionization that will generate free charge carriers that will cause spurious signals in the circuit. But when we talk about um, cosmic ray radiation induced ionization, we're not really talking about direct ionization. We're talking about indirect ionization. We're talking about the protons and the neutrons, mostly the neutrons, in the ground-based radiation environment, having a nuclear reaction inside of the sensitive volume or very near the sensitive volume of an electronic component producing secondary particles. And it's these secondaries that are highly ionizing. These are particles like alphas and heavy ions. There's three main sources of these heavily ionizing secondaries um, that we need to worry about as users of electronic components. The first one are the so-called neutron capture reactions. Those happen only with thermal neutrons, very low energy neutrons. They are specific reactions between the thermal neutrons and isotopes of certain elements. The most common one in that contaminates our electronic components is boron-10. It's a naturally occurring isotope of boron and it can undergo the neutron capture reaction resulting in an alpha particle and a recoil lithium-7 ion, both of which are highly ionizing. Most elements do not have the capability to undergo neutron capture and are not worrisome, but the ones that do result in very highly ionizing particles. At the opposite end of the neutron spectrum energy and also available to protons, there's a series of uh, spallation and scattering reactions that can happen. In these reactions, a highly ionized, ionizing particle, say a neutron, will bump into the nucleus of um, a silicon atom, and then many reaction paths are possible that will result in some number of highly ionizing secondaries being produced, typically a heavy reco recoil nucleus and some lighter uh, components. And you see on the plot on the right just how much uh, charge deposition or LET these heavy recoil, ion, recoil ions can give. 
the third source of um, SEEs in electronic components are actually not related to the cosmic ray. They're related to the presence of radioactive contaminant in the Earth's crust, like uranium and thorium. These can undergo fission decays and release a bunch of alpha particles. If they are present in your electronic component, typically they would be in the packaging, very close to the sensitive volume, uh, they can cause SEEs. But because these are not introduced by the radiation environment, um, but they are rather a artifact of the manufacturing process. This is not something that you can investigate through the use of neutron and proton beams. I just wanted to point out that this has been an issue in the past. Manufacturer these days control for this contamination much better, but unless you have certainty from a part component that this has been checked, you might have alphas coming directly from inside of your um, part. And then I know I said I wasn't going to talk about muons very much, but I want to circle back a little bit. They are very abundant in the cosmic ray um, air showers. They are low LET and their likelihood of interaction is quite low, but with new technologies and smaller structure sizes, Overall, the trend has been for the critical charge of devices to go down, which means that the lower LET muons might still be able to give sufficient charge um, to induce SEs. There's also been recent work uh, on a, measuring a process called the muon capture that can only happen to negative muons. The muon capture process can create high LET secondaries much like the spallation process does. And so in certain energy ranges for certain devices, it might actually, there might actually be an, another source, a so far very poorly studied source of muon induced SEs. So this has been a field of active research in recent years. The bad news about that is that muon test capability worldwide is limited to these exact five facilities and not a single other one, as far as I'm aware. But the good news is that these facilities, uh, one of which is Triumph, are all already involved with the radiation effects community and are in general willing to make muon beam available uh, to users for these kinds of studies. So I've given you a portrait of the complicated nature of um, the radiation environment and the nuclear reactions that can cause single event effects. There's another side to this story, which is that the types of effects are very numerous and specialized and complicated. If you So there is a level of complexity to the problem of radiation hardness and reliability in a radiation environment that is non-negligible. If you add to that, that there's many beam types that are available for testing and that there exists many standards, I don't even claim that these are all of them, um, you end up in a position where trying to design a test for a component, for an application is a really challenging task. Uh, so I decided to give you my example workflow of test design, trying to hit on all of the crucial questions that you need to ask yourself when you design tests. There are many ways to approach test design, and this is just one example, but I think it hits all of the crucial notes. The first phase here is an information gathering phase um, where one thinks about the operational parameters of the application. Where will it be used? What's the radiation field there? How long do I need to operate this device to meet the minimum requirements, the ideal requirements, et cetera? And then I need to th think about the nature of the device. What are the components that I'm working on? What is the system intended to do? Then for each component in the system and for the system as a whole, I need to do a first pass of radiation vulnerability assessment. What types of SE can I see in these components and in this system? At this point, 
I should step back for a second and look at the existing information. Um, there is a lot of reliable test data that is that exists and is public. And so I might make myself and my life a lot easier if I go to reliable sources of data on SEs and see if anybody has done exactly the test I'm about to try to do. Probably I will still have to do some work myself anyway. So once I have collected any useful data that already exists, I can go back to my planning and do my um, application risk assessment and the prioritization of the test. Which of the components and which parts of the system can tolerate errors and errors of what type? Which ones can't tolerate? What are acceptable rates, not acceptable rates? What is mission critical, safety critical? And what can I live without in a worst case scenario? Once I've done that, I should take the highest priority issue or test and then design my test loop. I should establish my target fluence um, or the number of SEs that I want to see before I declare that I have enough data. Ideally, I should have both a fluence and a number of SE in mind so that when I am at the facility, I know exactly when I have met all of my requirements and I can move on to the next test or next device. Um, it's also really important to understand for each component, for each SE type, what's the signal that an SE has occurred? How am I gonna detect it? How am I going to record it and count it? It's especially important if I'm looking for transient SEs, it's pretty obvious how to pick up on a bit flip. It's not always easy to pick up on transient signals. Um, then I should make sure to decide how I'm gonna operate my system or my component while it is under test. For example, which bias voltage am I gonna use? Am I gonna use the normal nominal operational one? Am I gonna derate so that I'm in the worst case scenario? Do I do both? Um, what makes sense for me and my application? And I need to think about what happens once I've seen an SE. Um, how do I reset? Do I need the beam off to be able to reset? Or can I reset while the beam is still on? If I'm looking at destructive effects, how do I swap parts? How much overhead is that gonna cost me? How many spares do I bring? Which components do I bring spares for, et cetera? And then after the first pass of the actual test loop planning, you should contact the facility that you're targeting for this test and check in with them. Make sure that the beam and the beam room that you are going to use match what you are trying to achieve um, and make sure that anything and everything you want to bring in terms of support equipment is acceptable to the facility and that they can protect it from the prompt radiation of the beam. You'll probably get some really useful feedback from them. You'll probably have to do the a couple passes of you know improving the test loop, talking to the facility, improving the test loop, talking to the facility. But you, once you have a test loop and a test plan that you're happy with, you're convinced will work for your test, and the facility tells you it is A-OK, -okay, it is safe to do, and it will work, then you should just build the setup, come to the facility, run the test. Um, and that makes it seem like that's all there is to it. Um, but I want to point out that you can save yourself a lot of heartache by um, thinking about the rest of the logistics that come with testing outside of the test design proper. It is, of course, the most important part, but it's heartbreaking for us as facility officers to see people have a really bad time during their test because travel visas haven't come in on time or equipment is stuck in customs or you haven't allocated enough time for shipping all of this equipment that you need. The other thing is that we're all nuclear facilities. Uh, we generally cannot bring people on site um, on the day that they request. There are all of these training and safety requirements that you have to go through before you can come inside a nuclear facility. Make sure you allocate enough time to discuss these with the facility and to go through all of the requirements that they have. It's a shame if you have, if you just can't use the beam time that you booked because one of the non-test related logistics fall through. 
So that's what I had to say about testing. And then I want to say a few words about Triumph. Triumph is Canada's national laboratory for nuclear and particle physics. And it, has, it was founded over 50 years ago. It's located in Vancouver, British Columbia, at the southern end of the campus of the University of British Columbia. You can see it on this picture at the very bottom. It's a primarily a research facility, and we have three main research focus, nuclear and particle physics, accelerator technology development, and nuclear medicine and radiopharmacology. On this schematic of the lab, you see our accelerator complex. Every black structure on this slide is a particle accelerator. Every yellow line is a beam line, um, and the buildings are in blue. The big black structure with the pinwheel on the inside is our main cytotron. It's the heart of the whole accelerator complex. There are three different beam lines that we use, uh, some of the time at least, for electronic component testing. Um, the two that are marked with red dots can be used to generate either proton or neutron beams. And the one in purple is a dedicated neutron beam line. Our main cyclotron circulates a negative hydrogen ion beam, which is converted to a proton beam only at the very end when it is extracted from the cyclotron. The diameter of the cyclotron is 18 meters. The first beam out of our cyclotron was delivered in 1974. The maximum proton energy that we can have is 520 MeV. However, Nowadays, we tend to operate with a maximum energy of 480 MeV because it's a little bit easier on our infrastructure. In typical operation, we extract three or four beams from the main cyclotron simultaneously at all different energies between 63 and 480 MeV. There's typically well over 200 microamperes of total circulating beam. And because this is an isochronous cycl cyclotron, we operate in a continuous wave beam mode. We've made proton beams available for commercial testing of electronic components for radiation effects since 1995 and neutron beams since 2002. This is a picture of our main radiation test room where the two red dots were on the schematic a few slides ago. Um, and where two of the proton beam paths are available. Um, they are labeled beamline 2C and beamline 1B based on their extracted position from the cyclotron. This is a big open room um, and the beam come, travels directly in air in these rooms. So it is completely unsafe to be there while the beam is on. Um, people who come to test will typically be working from the uh, control room, which is behind the back wall in this picture. And you have to go through a little maze of shielding blocks to get to the control room to, make, to ensure that it is a safe place to be even when the beam is on. The difference between the two beam lines that are in this room are the available energy ranges. So beam line 2C was initially a proton therapy beam line. Um, and it is the lower energy of the two beam lines. There are two standard extracted beam energies, 63 and 105 MeV. However, we can use our continuous degrader system to set the beam to any energy that is below 105 MeV. The maximum proton flux on this beam line is about one times 10 to the eight protons per centimeter square per second. It's adjustable on request by the testers, and it can go down all the way down to just 100 or so proton per centimeter square per second. The maximum beam size at our normal test position is either a square that is five by five centimeters or a disc that is 7.5 centimeters in diameter. This beam line with its lower energy is really easy to adjust and manipulate um, so we are able to support lots of different testing configurations, and we're always happy to investigate weird requests and, and requests for very custom um, parameters for users when it is useful to deviate from our standard testing. Here's a few more pictures 
of beamline 2C. The test position is normally on this table here. We have a remote controlled positioning device that we can put on this table. You can see it on the picture on the right. And then you see between the test position and the wall of the room where the beam comes out, a variety of devices. The devices typically serve one of two purposes. It's either a beam shaping device like a collimator or a scatterer, or it is a beam monitoring device like a, a dosimetry counter. Beamline 1B is our higher energy beamline. There are once again, two standard extracted proton energies on this beam line. One is 480 MeV, the other one is 355. The maximum proton flux is a little bit lower at around four times 10 to the seven protons per centimeter square per second. That is for radio protection purposes, this higher energy beam is more dangerous. The flux is adjustable down to very low flux by user request once again. And the maximum beam size is a little bit larger at 7.5 by 7.5 centimeters. We cannot degrade the energy of this beam because the high energy protons are extremely penetrative um, and would radioactivate our degraders very badly. So that's not something that we can change the beam energy, but all of the other beam parameters are very flexible on this beam line also, and we are able to support lots of options for testing. This is a picture of the beamline 1B in proton testing mode. So the, you can see the proton beam standard position and on this picture, our remote control alignment device is um, in the picture. You see the big cube of metal that is just upstream of the test position, that's our collimator. And now you understand why it is much difficult for us to, um, it is quite difficult for us to shape this beam. You will need 25 centimeters of steel to um, be able to effectively shield the beam. You cannot see it in this picture very well, but just before the collimator, we have um, the symmetry devices on the beam line as well because the symmetry is important. Your test is not useful unless you know exactly how much beam you put on the device. So we always provide inline real-time dosimetry with ion chambers that are non-intercepting beam counters. Um, and we cross calibrate them daily to a reference intercepting device. We also regularly check that our beam uniformity is better than 10%, which is the standard that all testing facilities um, aim to meet. We test that multiple ways. We use radiochromic films. You see an example of a picture of the beam um, taken on beamline 2C with a radiochromic film here. We also have a SRAM based golden board decimeter that we use regularly. And we have some small volume ion chambers, optical fibers, diodes that we can use to scan across the beam spot to make sure that we are meeting our um, uniformity requirement. Both of the proton beam lines that I've presented to you can be transformed into neutron mode, but because beamline 2C is low energy, I won't really talk about it. It is not terribly interesting for um, atmospheric style, ground level style testing. I'll focus on beamline 1B. To convert the proton beam of beamline 1B into an atmospheric spectrum like neutron beam, uh, we use a spallation target. So we put a very thick piece of lead, it is 15 centimeters thick in the path of the proton beam. The proton strikes this target, undergoes spallation reactions, and because the target is so thick, only neutral particles can escape it. Only neutrons can escape. And then you end up with a beam of neutrons going into the room past the target. There's a little schematic on this slide of how that happens. And because of the way that we create the beam, it is it is a spreading cone when it comes into the room. What that means is that both the beam diameter and the beam intensity vary with distance 
into the room from the entrance point of the beam. Um, so it is possible to test smaller components and devices close to the wall with a higher flux or to set up further back in the room and test very large components. For example, this is an entire server rack uh, with a very wide beam and do really integrated system level testing. So that's beamline 1B. There's a, also a third beamline that I have not talked about so far. It's our dedicated neutron test beamline that we call TNF. TNF is special and completely different from what we do in the other area of the lab. Um, it uses the neutrons that are generated, again, by spallation from the beam dump of one of our science beamlines. So it is operated symbiotically with beamline 1A, one of our principal science beamlines. Um, the flux at TNF is about 10 times higher than the maximum flux that can achieve that beamline 1B. But uh, there are all sorts of weird and quirky constraints with size that come from having such an intense beam and working off of such an intense proton beam. So what happens at TNF is that the incoming protons strike the beam dump and then there we have put in a open channel of air inside of what should normally be shielding to protect the this area of the laboratory from the neutron field around the beam dump. And then from this floor area where it is safe for humans to stand during beam operation, we have another perpendicular narrow access channel that we can use to lower devices for testing perpendicular to the first open channel where the neutron beam is coming out. Uh, so advantage of this facility, the flux is much higher. It is very available because we run the science beam line all the time. Downsides are that you are the symbiotic user, um, and as such, you don't control how the beamline is running. That means that the maximum energy out of the neutron spectrum varies depending on the needs of the science users, and that also means that they decide the flux. However, the typical neutron flux at TNF is between two and three times 10 to the six neutrons per centimeter square per second. Um, the beam size is fixed, and it's the size of the aperture in the shielding, five centimeters by 15 centimeters. I've mentioned a few times that we make our beams through spallation, which is essentially the process that uh, primary cosmic rays undergo in cosmic ray showers. That's why they're a good match for reference neutron spectrum. Here, I wanted to show you a comparison of the energy spectrum of the two neutron beam lines I've talked to you about, TNF and beamline 1B, um, and compare them to the JDEC reference spectrum for atmospheric neutrons. You see that up to the maximum energy of the beam line, the protons on the beam line, the spectrum are a very good match. And you see that the acceleration factor at our facility is huge. It is 10 to the 8 at beam line 1B and 10 to the 9 at TNF. And what that means is that even using a pretty big beam at beam line 1B, say a 30 centimeter beam, one hour of beam line 1B neutron beam is equivalent to close to 4,000 years of operation of a device at sea level, or six to nine years of continuous flight operation of a device that would be on an airplane. It's not shown on this graph, which where the minimum energy is one MeV, but there are thermal neutrons that are present in both of our beam lines. Uh, we can manipulate the thermal component of the beam line at the test position. We can either suppress it by shielding the test device in cadmium, or we can enhance it by adding polyethylene moderator close to the device. Um, what that means is that you don't have to go to a dedicated thermal neutron facility to figure out if your devices, is, if some of the SEs in your device are coming from thermal neutrons. You can manipulate the thermal neutron fraction, compare your error rate with and without this manipulation, and extract your sensitivity to thermal neutrons directly at our atmospheric facility. 
Neutron beam dissymmetry is also really important and it's trickier to do than proton beam dissymmetry in general. It's even trickier at Triumph than at some other facilities because as I've mentioned, we have a cyclotron operating in continuous wave mode. What that means is we can't do the time of flight techniques that pulse facilities can do to measure their neutron spectrum. What we do instead is the, that we calibrate the beam dose rate and uniformity, uniformity at least annually using um, gamma spectra from activation reactions and tin foils. We use radiochromic films and we use our um, SRAM golden base dissimilar, which is also sensitive to neutrons. To calculate our spectrum, we use a combination of measurements from activation foils of a variety of materials that are sensitive to different parts of the spectrum. And we also have simulated very thoroughly both of our facilities in Fluca, a Monte Carlo simulation code. You see on the right of this slide, a comparison of the shape, transverse shape of the beam at beamline 1B measured with our SRAM golden board decimeter, which you can see a picture of at the top. And you see the histogram is the outcome from our simulation. We know this lets us confirm that our simulation geometry is really accurate because the match is excellent. And also from the simulation output, we are able to confirm that the um, proton contamination of our neutron beamline at beamline 1B which could be a worry because the spallation target is very close to the test position, that contamination is very, very low. You really are getting a very pure neutron beam. And then for the day-to-day -day dissymmetry, at TNF, we count neutrons directly through the use of a BF3 counter. Um, at beamline 1B, we have carefully measured conversions factors from our proton dissymmetry system. So we do proton dissymmetry and we use these conversion factors to calculate the neutron fluence and flux at beamline 1B. I wanted to talk, I want to switch topics again a little bit and talk to you about recent um, successes that some of our customers have had using proton beams to test for ground-based applications that would normally be tested using neutron beams. Um, proton beams have the advantage of being generally somewhat more available than atmospheric spectrum neutron beams um, and happen to be easier to manipulate, as I've mentioned. So they're an interesting test ground. Another observation that is important to keep in mind is that sufficiently energetic protons have opened to them the same kind of nuclear reactions, spallation, elastic scattering, elastic scattering, that are available to fast neutron. What that means is that there's the potential for the um, LET spectrum of the secondary ionizing particles from proton-induced and neutron-induced nuclear reactions to match very well. This hypothesis is extremely well supported by both calculations and data. So on this slide on the left, you see in green, the induced SEE rate calculated as a function of the LET, for the chip IR atmospheric neutron beam. Chip IR is a facility in the UK that you might be familiar with. And then you see in red, the same distribution of calculated event rate as a function of LET of the fragments for 200 MeV protons. They match incredibly well. So the calculation, and our theoretical understanding of nuclear physics and electronic behavior supports this hypothesis that protons can be used as an alternative to neutrons in certain contexts. This is also an observation that is supported by data. On the right, this plot shows the SEU cross-section measured for the whole of our 
a golden board, SRAM golden board, the symmetry device at Triumph. Um, all the points are measurements that were taken for different monoenergetic proton beams. And you see there that there's a lot of features and at the very low energy, the protons are directly ionizing. And that means a very big increase of the SEU cross-section. At around 35 MeV, there's a specific um, enhancement that is due to a known nuclear reaction of protons in silicon. But once you get higher than that, once you get to 50 or so and above, there are two important observations that we can make. One is that the SEU cross-section is broadly speaking independent of the proton energy beam, the proton beam energy, sorry, and that all of the measurements that were taken with monoenergetic proton beams are very, very close to the measurement that we took at TNF with our broad spectrum neutron beam. So what that means is that yes, for this device, you can get an accurate estimate of your SEU cross-section from a proton beam instead of a neutron beam, even if you are interested in applications at ground level. What this means for test design is that it might be beneficial and it might be useful for you as a tester and as a test designer to quickly screen your individual components early on with a proton beam, you'll get a good idea of your SEU or SE sensitivity. And then at the very end of your test cycle, you can run integrated system testing with more confidence that you have not overlooked the sensitivity of a given component and would increase confidence of success. So circling back to proton and neutron beam tests at Triumph, um, now that I've had this little sidebar about uh, why I've talked so much about proton beams since we are interested in a neutron-rich environment. Testing with atmospheric light neutron beams is the gold standard for ground-based applications because the beam energy spectrum matches the application fast neutron spectrum incredibly well. It's convenient to do because large beam sizes are available, the beam penetrates deeply into DUTs, so you can test large stacks of devices, you can test whole systems all at once. Uh, at most facilities, you can modulate the thermal neutron component so you can get the thermal sensitivity also for free. Um, the downsides are that neutron beams are difficult to shape, collimate and shield, so they're not easily manipulated. The spallation neutron uh, beam generation is really inefficient, so, you will always have a much lower neutron beam flux than you would have had a proton beam flux if you were using directly the generating proton beam. Um, and specific to Triumph, we have about 3,500 hours of beam time available every year at TNF, which is pretty good. Uh, we have only about 800 hours of beam time available at 1B every year, which is quite low, and it's our most restricted beam line. Um, if you are setting up to test with medium to high energy proton beams, then you will have access, you would have access to much higher beam fluxes. It's about a factor 100 at Triumph. Um, the beam is easy to shield and collimate. It's ideal for quickly screening single components on simple test boards and systems, but the maximum beam size is small. The beam penetration is much lower and it would never be appropriate to test an entire system or to test a stack of boards. At Triumph, our proton beams have a total availability of about 2000 hours a year, which is moderate. So to summarize, single event effects are a source of concern for high reliability electronic applications at ground level. And accelerated testing with neutrons, and in some case protons, is one of the most practical ways to um, get an accurate estimate of the failure risk due to cosmic ray radiation. These accelerated tests with BEAM are complex and costly, so careful design and planning uh, is really important to ensure that you use your BEAM time resources well. I think, and this is my personal recommendation, that taking a broad and integrated approach to test planning, building it into the project cycle and doing clever things like testing more than once, including an early proton-based screening step and 
a late system-wide neutron test, for example, it can overall save time um, and money to your project. So think about your testing early, think about your testing often is the message. Um, and I want to point out that uh, every beam facility is unique because most of the available beam facilities are research environments, very custom, very unique. So you should not hesitate to lean on facility personnel to understand how to best use your time. What are the specific characteristics and quirks of where you're going so that you can be absolutely certain that your test data is as good as can be, as reliable as can be. Um, I've included a complete list of the resources that I've used to put this talk together. And I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you can find my coordinates linked from Triumph's PIF and NIF pages shown on this slide, or you can contact the conference organizers who will pass along the questions to me. Thank you.